Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Tom Dunn. I'm a partner at the law firm of Pierce Atwood in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, I am the Division One Chair. Um, the Div Division One has put on this toolbox talk series. Um, you can visit our ABA communities page to see the toolbox talk programs that are happening for the rest of the calendar year. Um, today, we are partnering up with Division Seven and Division Nine. Thank you to uh, Jeremy Brummond and Mike Clark for uh, for joining us in this program. Uh, Saqib Khan on, uh, is part of the Toolbox Talk uh, Committee for Division One, and he's going to serve as the moderator of today's program. Saqib, go ahead. Thank you, Tom. Um, so uh, today, uh, we would like to have a discussion about the desperate measures um, that we sometimes have to employ to secure prejudgment remedies and to secure payment and gain traction in those sticky situations where um, your client is due a lot of money, um, your client might be a downstream party, a material supplier, a subcontractor, um, so someone sitting in those kinds of shoes, and uh, payment's not forthcoming and it needs to come quick. Um, with us here today are Gregory Gillis. Um, Gregory is uh, with the firm Sachs Tyranny and practices in courts across the state of Arizona. Greg represents project participants of all classes from owners all the way down through suppliers in commercial and residential construction disputes. Uh, Greg is a member of the AAA panel of neutrals, um, has a Martindale Hubble rating of AV preeminent, and has been listed in Best Lawyers of America for over a decade. Greg is a member of the forum in Division 7. Um, we also have Christopher Eng, uh, who is a managing partner at uh, Gibbs Gidden in lovely Southern California. Uh, Chris primarily represents companies in a wide range of business and commercial and construction negotiations and disputes. Chris has written for a number of publications, including Engineering News Record and Walter Kluwer's California Construction Law. Chris is an adjunct professor of business law at the School of Business and Economics at California, California State University, Northridge, and has taught legal environment of business at Pepperdine University, and has also been a guest lecturer of construction law at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Chris has also spoken for a number of organizations, including the forum, of which he is a member of Division 9, where things are fine. <laughs> Chris? Greg, please take it away. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody, and or actually good afternoon, depending where you're at. And welcome to this uh, quick toolbox kit session on prejudgment remedies. And I think this is a pretty timely topic, uh, really, given all that is going on, as we know, in the world, the uh, looming recession, inflation, the ongoing war, supply chain issues, price escalation, material costs uh, skyrocketing funding uh, drying up left and right. I, we're seeing defaults for the first time in the subcontractor chain uh, on a regular basis for the first time, probably in the last 10 years. And so I think this is a, a really timely topic. And Greg at, and I come at it from slightly different perspectives. Uh, perhaps I represent more material suppliers, national suppliers, and, um, and some contractors. And I think Greg is more contractor heavy. And so I think our perspectives on, in thinking about how we protect our clients um, is important and, and front and center right now, given all of these fundamentals that are out there. Uh, no doubt the, the indicators that are out there, we see them in the media, in the news, you know, signal recession, recession, recession. The AIA semi-annual forecast shows construction spending increasing perhaps, but I think there are definitely some asterisks out there as we look ahead at what construction spending will actually do over the next 18 months and beyond. And one thing that's really interesting to us is, is bankruptcies. <clears throat> We're at historic lows, 40 year lows in bankruptcies. Um, might that be changing? It, it might be, and it might just be changing right now. Um, in the last 30 days or so, there is just anecdotally at least a little bit of an uptick in bankruptcy filings. So we'll see what happens. Um, but again, this presentation I think today is designed for us to be proactive. Think about things that we can bring to the table, discuss with our clients when we're thinking about not just mechanics liens and payment bonds and those sorts of things, but what other uh, prejudgment remedies and considerations do you have in your toolbox so that we can protect our clients and think uh, to, uh, how we can be the most effective uh, advocates for them as they try to do one of the most important things in business, which is collect their money. 
All right. Uh, thanks uh, to Division One and Sakib for uh, allowing uh, us to talk to you today. Um, we're going to gloss over mechanics, lanes, and payment bonds because we're assuming that most of the people that are on this call uh, already have at least a, a working knowledge of those and try to hit some of the items that might be uh, a little more uh, unique and uh, and not used so frequently. Uh, one of those is uh, prop pay statutes. These are statutes that your individual state uh, may have adopted. They require owners to disperse funds within a certain period of time after receiving a uh, payment application that uh, is acceptable and likewise require the GC uh, to in turn pass payment on down to subcontractors on a timely basis, uh, at least in Arizona. Uh, where I practice law, um, failure to comply with the prompt pay statute uh, triggers a statutory interest rate at 18% and forms a basis for recovery of attorney fees. So that's an arrow that you can use in, in your quiver, uh, making a demand ahead of time, yeah, perhaps uh, a prompt pay demand ahead of time uh, before filing a lawsuit. Uh, also, something that uh, Arizona borrowed from uh, Chris's state of California, a stop payment notices. I know those are not uniform uh, throughout the uh, uh, throughout the country, but uh, it allows uh, people in the uh, construction chain, GCs, subs, and suppliers, uh, to issue a stop payment notice. Since it's statutory, you need to comply with the requirements of uh, your particular statute. Uh, but in essence, it allows you to garnish uh, undistributed uh, construction funds for the payment of amounts that you are due. Uh, there are, at least in Arizona, bonded and uh, unbonded uh, stop notices. Uh, the obligations to hold the funds differ. So uh, make sure you confirm the statutory requirements uh, of your state if you have a stop payment notice statute. Uh, likewise, uh, most jurisdictions license contractors. And as part of that licensing, there can be a requirement that they have a contractor's license bond uh, that may cover both commercial work and residential work. Um, sometimes you can file a complaint at your uh, contractor licensing agency to make a claim against that contractor license bond. And certainly you can file, uh, you can add a count to your complaint uh, alleging a claim against the license bond. And it brings pressure on the uh, contractor to resolve your dispute because if they lose, uh, they're at risk of the bonding company uh, either voluntarily because they think you have a good claim or uh, by judicial decision paying out the license bond, which then terminates uh, typically their ability to continue contracting uh, in their states. Uh, sometimes there's tort claims that you may be able to bring against uh, a contractor. Uh, and then there's other uh, kind of extra contractual uh, obligations, unjust enrichment being one, uh, allowing if you're a sub uh, who's unpaid from the general contractor to present a claim upstream against the owner if the owner hasn't in turn paid the general contractor. Uh, it's a way to add someone else to the number of parties that might be able to pay you. And then um, likewise, promissory estoppel, promises of payment were made if uh, materials were delivered uh, and supplies provided. Uh, and finally, on this page, constructive trust. Uh, some states uh, have a statute that provides if an owner pays a general contractor, that general contractor holds those funds in trust for the benefit of unpaid subs and suppliers. And so they can, uh, at least in Arizona, uh, in a residential context, you can assert a claim directly against the contract, uh, the corporate principles for failing to uh, provide those funds. Uh, sometimes there's other third parties. Don't forget to think about guarantees. Are there uh, guarantors of the obligations? Uh, sometimes there can be joint check agreements uh, requiring payments from the GC to the sub and supplier. Um, and, and alter ego, we're starting to see this a little bit more where uh, there might be some improper compliance with corporate formalities, allowing a claim to be made uh, that the principals or the alter ego or another entity is a successor, or there's been some kind of fraudulent transfer. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, well, not lastly, there's commercial code UCC rights I'll talk about in a second, but uh, fraudulent lien 
waivers. Uh, this is something that we saw uh, in the past. Uh, uh, subcontractors sometimes are known to forge suppliers lien waivers and then pass them upstream to get payment. And Chris, I think uh, when we were talking about this, you had a recent example, in fact. Yeah, no, it, you know, I've had it twice now in the last seven days. And this is anecdotally where I know the wheels may be coming off the bus for some of our specialty trade contractors, uh, because I've got two different situations where subcontractors have forged waivers and releases and, uh, and uh, switched around numbers using Adobe Acrobat, or have deposited joint checks and have either endorsed both names, even though um, it was a fraudulent endorsement, um, or just try to cash a joint check and the banks have let that happen. Don't forget if that happens to your clients that both your owner clients and the uh, affected uh, party downstream, like let's say your supplier who the joint check was written to, have a statutory claim under the Uniform Commercial Code against the lenders. So against both the depositing bank and the, uh, the paying bank, both banks are now subject defendants in a potential action. So if that were to happen, don't forget about that arrow in your quiver. So uh, most of these rights arise from the contract. And uh, as Sam Ewing said, contracts are agreements made up of big words and little type. So to talk about big words, I'm gonna throw it back to Chris. Yeah, and, and this is a reminder um, for, especially those of us that represent GCs or owners primarily, we forget a lot of the time that contracts are more than just a modified AIA or an, a an AGC doc or consensus doc form uh, contract. There are lots of contract documents. They come in all different shapes and sizes. And especially when we're talking about suppliers of transformers or st structural steel or whatever the commodity may be, Remember that most of those transactions are not done by signed contracts. And it almost takes us back to law school to remember the battle of the forms. Remember that? Remember 2207? Uh, for those of you that, that may not have uh, practiced in that area regularly, the vast majority of my clients that are national suppliers do not form contracts based upon signed contracts. They engage in multi-million, tens of millions of dollars of, of uh, supply uh, contracts on a particular project based upon the exchange of a purchase order and an invoice. And it seems hard to believe when I teach this at uh, my local universities here, I think that's where my students usually go. Well, that's, how does that, how's that possible? You mean, why don't both people sign a contract? Well, in the commercial world, of course, we're always trying to grease the wheels of commerce. We can't get two signatures on sales of materials contracts. It would grind commerce to a halt. So 2207 of the Uniform Commercial Code steps in and it dictates what the rights, duties, and responsibilities of the parties are when documents are exchanged. So that's when we're looking at force majeure, price escalation, um, and all those sorts of things, limitations of liability, warranty. Sometimes they come from a credit agreement that the subcontractor or the general contractor uh, may have signed with the supplier. Sometimes they come from a purchase order document. Sometimes they come from uh, a sales order confirmation or an invoice, right? All those T's and C's. Maybe they incorporate by reference online terms and conditions. I mean, I got 30 of those right now on my desk trying to figure out what terms control in the event of a price escalation, which is obviously hot and heavy right now, or significant delays. Who's on the hook? Remember that, again, contracts um, in the material supplier world sometimes are not even formed by anyone's terms. They are formed based upon the gap fillers of the Uniform Commercial Code, which are very buyer friendly. That's typically the nature of it. Separate three hour course on Battle of the Forms down the road coming, but just don't forget about that when you are thinking about these sorts of things. So after you've looked at uh, the terms of the contract and kind of figured out uh, what rights you might have, what obligations might exist, uh, sometimes, like Chris mentioned, there might be a credit agreement. And on the back side, which we don't always see these days, uh, as forms go back and forth over the internet, could be a provision that granted uh, a seller uh, uh, on credit and payments over time a security interest. It could be a purchase money security interest that's retained by the seller. Uh, and as long as that's perfected by filing with the appropriate filing office in your jurisdiction, you could have collateral that you could look to to get paid. 
Uh, that enables you to pursue your UCC rights, which could include demanding that the debtor assemble the collateral and give it back to you. And if that's unsuccessful, then you can proceed to foreclose your security interest in that particular uh, piece of collateral. Um, suspension of work, I'm going to uh, talk about in just a second. But you know, look for change orders, price escalation clauses, notice provisions, pay particular attention to notice provisions because sometimes it dictates how you need to proceed. For example, there could be an ADR provision in the uh, construction contract that may designate the architect as an initial decision maker that you take your dispute to. Sometimes there's a requirement that there's a meeting of corporate principles to set down for a period of time to negotiate. And, and then also, as the Division One members uh, know, there can be mediation and arbitration uh, requirements contained uh, in those contract rights as well. So if, if you've kind of pursued all of your um, pre-judgment uh, or pre-lawsuit filing rights and, and you haven't gotten anywhere, um, then you can move on to, uh, oh, uh, I, I, I skipped a slide. Uh, right, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I, I did wanna talk about uh, UCC rights. So one, uh, you might have a statutory right to suspend work. Uh, make sure you look at your statute, make sure you look at your contract to make sure that they're uniform. If not, I always adopt the longer period, but you can provide notice that you're not paid to the GC, to the owner, to other upstream parties, that you're going to suspend your work after a stated period of time. And the benefit is you're not in breach of contract if you've properly uh, exercised uh, your stop work notice rights. Um, another uh, kind of pre-lawsuit filing right that's not used very frequently is called reclamation. It is provided by uh, Section 2702 of the Uniform Commercial Code, so look at your state's version of it. Uh, but what it really allows, if you are a seller of goods on credit and you sold to an insolvent buyer, you have the ability to reclaim those goods, as in make demand to take them back, provided you make that written demand within 10 days of when the buyer receives those goods. So say you're whatever, you're selling drywall on credit and you drop ship it and you end up finding out that uh, three days later, your, uh, uh, your customer has filed for bankruptcy. You can issue a reclamation demand uh, there's been some modifications to it by the Bankruptcy Code, 11 U.S.C. Section 546C. It extends your time from 10 to 45 days to make your reclamation demand. And if the bankruptcy happens to be filed during that 45-day period, then you have 20 days from the date of bankruptcy filing to make your reclamation demand. So it extends it. And it also changes your creditor classification, making you an administrative expense claimant. Uh, allowing you to um, uh, elevate your priority for repayment. And, and Chris, you've used a different section of the UCC successfully. Yeah, and that's 2609. <clears throat> and this is one that I think it's all it's important for all practitioners to be uh, uh, knowledgeable about. It's probably one of the frequently, um, well, I haven't seen it used a lot in the last 10 years, but I know since April of 2020, uh, since the pandemic, onset, we have suggested this at nauseum to our clients, and I know they're using it, um, and successfully so, and it really does give another arrow in your quiver, uh, gives your client another argument that if they want to try to uh, breach or, um, or withdraw, terminate a contract, that they can do so perhaps safely, um, and I say that, of course, with quotation marks around it, because we all know um, that Every, everyone, every remedy like that that you exercise does carry with it risk. But 2609 is about adequate assurances of performance by either side. So let's say you're representing a supplier of goods and you are concerned because your customer's DSO, days outstanding on the receivables, is you know, over 60 days. And for the first time in 20 years, we have your relationship with this particular customer. 
Um, you're growing more concerned about the customer. You're hearing about insolvency, turnover in the company, and you've got a million dollar shipment or you've got a $7 million transformer um, that you are about to push out. And you don't want to do that because you know you may never get paid. Um, and so one of the things you have at your arsenal is to, in writing, demand adequate assurances of performance. And if the other side does not reply within a reasonable time, you have the right to suspend performance until such reasonable assurances are made by the other side. Now, what are those reasonable assurances? Well, I've got about you know, 100 uh, case law um, citations for you when it talks about that. It's pretty amorphous, but you know, is it looking at uh, financials from the customer? Is it looking at uh, bank account statements? What are adequate assurances? Well, that's something you can play with a little bit. And on the other side, it's a, in the same vein, if you're an owner or a GC, and you're about to release a significant payment to someone who you don't know has this materials in stock anymore, uh, or maybe they've adjusted the lead time to an unacceptable time period where now you are concerned that you may not get your materials on time and you wanna go cover with another supplier, you also have the right, rather than just breach the contract, you have the right to demand adequate assurances of performance. Let the supplier show you, hey, we've got the material ready to go. It's an inventory, it'll be shipped out. Show me that adequate assurance. Otherwise, I'm not releasing my payment and I may have to go cover elsewhere. So 2609, um, if, you, if you aren't familiar with it, please do review it in your state's um, uh, form because it is a powerful tool uh, when it comes to the sales of goods. Um, Chris, while we're on the, uh, the subject, you had mentioned um, longstanding relationships. There's a question in the chat um, related to um, uh, the, the types of relationships sometimes you see here where a downstream party wants to do business in the future, they want to maintain goodwill. Um, how would you use, and Greg, you as well, how would you use these types of remedies in a situation where your client, or how would you counsel, counsel a client where they're concerned about um, ruffling feathers too much here? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll start with, um, uh, you know, a lot of these can, um, they, they don't have to take the format of, um, uh, uh, you know, written, um, uh, demands on lawyers' letterhead, right? This can come in a touchy-feely um, uh, sort of marketing communication on your client's uh, letterhead. So um, when you're thinking about these remedies, it doesn't have to be always from the lawyer. I mean, sometimes you, us lawyers ghostwrite for our clients, um, and there are ways to try to salvage business relationships. I think as lawyers, sometimes we are at fault for always putting our legal hat on and not really wearing the hat of the businessman or the president of the company that is concerned about those relationships. But that, that's one sort of suggestion is, um, is understand that, that you don't have to always have formal uh, legal language to trigger some of these protections. And, and I just chime in as to reclamation. Usually the, the other side's insolvent. So there's not going to be an ongoing relationship, but uh, I encourage counsel to at least ghostwrite those to make sure that uh, everything that needs to be stated in your reclamation demand is actually contained in the demand. But it can open up a line of communication with the party that you're selling to. And maybe you can reach some agreement about how you're going to allow them to continue to use those uh, goods that you've supplied. So uh, in the rest of our time, we have two different, these are uh, uh, remedies that you get uh, by virtue of filing a lawsuit. And, and while I say that uh, with respect to uh, replevin or writ of possession, I always encourage, uh, you do have the right of self-help repossession, meaning you go take back whatever it is. If it's the transformer that you sold, uh, you drop shipped it. You can show up and take it off the job site in the middle of the night. You can do that provided you don't breach the piece. And breaching the piece is considered cutting the lock on the gate and driving in. So if you have to take steps to breach the piece in order to reclaim the piece of equipment uh, that you're unpaid for, you're going to have to go to court and you're going to have to file for a writ of possession or a writ of replevin. Um, at least in Arizona, uh, you can be entitled to one of these uh, writs of replevin where you have an interest in a particular piece of equipment or, or a, an item of collateral uh, in, in, in a couple instances. One is you're an owner or you lease equipment 
that gives you entitlement to uh, obtain the equipment. And the other is if there's a thought that the, or, or there's information that the a debtor is about to leave the state or has secreted assets, uh, those serve as a basis for uh, applying for a writ of replevin. and you file a complaint. It's driven by each state. So uh, look at your state requirements. You file the supporting documents. You almost always have to post a bond. Uh, in Arizona, the bond is one and a half times the value of the collateral. So your supporting documents have to establish a value for the collateral. And then once you uh, uh, obtain, uh, and these can be obtained in certain instances without notice. So the other side doesn't know that you've uh, uh, sought these items. Uh, you can also do it with notice where the uh, debtor has receives notice that you're seeking a writ and has 10 days to object. But in any event, you ultimately get an order and a writ that directs the sheriff to go out and pick up the piece of equipment. And if you've done it without uh, notice, the first information that the debtor has that you're exercising your rights is the sheriff showing up at the job site and saying, we're here to take back Chris's uh, $7 million uh, uh, transformer. So it, it's a it's a right that uh, exists in certain instances, and it's a pretty powerful right, especially if you meet the statutory criteria to obtain it without notifying the other side. And similarly, but differently, uh, the writ of attachment. I know it's available in almost all of our jurisdictions. I think it's one of the most underutilized remedies for prejudgment attachment of assets. Uh, talk about security, talk about leverage. Uh, it gives you the right if someone were to file bankruptcy 90 days later to be a secured creditor in their bankruptcy. It also allows you to be the squeaky wheel. It does require your client to invest probably a few thousand bucks up front to get an order allowing your client to attach the debtor's assets, real property in some states, bank accounts, um, uh, installing keepers, what have you, almost like post-judgment remedies in a pre-judgment setting. And like with the writ of possession, if the exigency exists, you can get that relief on an ex party basis within 24 to 48 hours. So it is a, a remedy. Any, any contract matter that's $50,000 or more where there's a liquidated sum that I think I could prove beyond the preponderance of evidence, you know, 51% standard, I'm going to do it. I'm going to file it uh, with my client's permission because worst come to worst, I'm getting free discovery quickly right? I'm getting that, dis I'm getting discovery in the form of declarations on the other side as to why they believe they have a defense to your contract claim immediately before I have to wait for the back and forth of formal written discovery. So writ of, writs of attachment, don't forget, be the squeaky wheel, be first in line, be the one that the other side has to come to and uh, negotiate with and resolve your attachment lien, because in effect, you may be putting them out of business if they don't take care of you. So think about the attachment lien, uh, as another remedy, along with the writ of possession in appropriate situations. I think that leaves us about three minutes. Um, so uh, with with, uh, with attachments, Chris, you mentioned keepers. Um, what, what do you mean by a keeper installing one? So depending on the business, uh, it's possible to have the sheriff armed with the attachment order sit at the debtor's place of business and collect uh, collect receivables <laughs> during the during the business day. I mean, it's not appropriate for all sorts of businesses, obviously, uh, but certainly it is. Uh, it is one that you know. If you get to that stage, there's a big problem. Usually, the threat of that uh, is enough to to get your your claim resolved. If these um, if there's a, an ability to do so short of filing bankruptcy. Seeing if we have any other questions here. Um, you know. Uh, Generally, uh, Craig and, and Chris, when when do you um, you know when do you counsel clients to actually take the step of investing the the, the resources to to chase one of these things up front rather than filing your complaint and proceeding straight to discovery? Well, at least as to uh, writs of possession or writs of replevin, uh, you do need to uh, you know typically we show that there's been a declaration of a default. And that you know you're unpaid. They need to be uh, providing you uh, either assembling the collateral and refuse to. That gives you a good basis to be able to say you need the help of the sheriff. 
uh, you know, you, you've kind of exhausted all of your pre uh, lawsuit filing remedies that we talked about uh, earlier in today's uh, uh, webinar uh, before you take that last step. Uh, but then usually we go silent for a period of time while we're seeking uh, a writ of replevin on an ex party basis. If the debtor reaches out to us, great, we'll strike some kind of deal. And if not, the sheriff will show up and say they're here to pick this up. And attachment, look, in any case, over $50,000 at issue, which is obviously most of our cases, I'm considering rid of attachment. Again, for all the reasons I've stated, um, if there's a, it's based on a contract claim and I wanna be the squeaky wheel, it may cost my client, I'm, I'm throwing it out there, a, a number out there, but three to 5,000 bucks to get this extraordinary relief. And again, if you're gonna be able to uh, make some noise and get some security and leverage for your client, rid of attachment's the way to do it, at least in California, and I know a lot of jurisdictions as well, uh, which give you so much power. It's an extraordinary remedy, but all you got to show to the judge is uh, preponderance of the evidence, at least in our jurisdiction. And Chris and I discussed this a little bit. It's a little different in Arizona. In Arizona, you have to uh, post a bond equal to the value of what it is you're attaching. So that eliminates your ability to use it in some instances. Uh, it's a much lower bonding amount, uh, according to Chris in California. And if, if you certainly have that lower dollar value uh, to post a bond, uh, it's definitely worth considering. Great. Thank, thank you, uh, Craig and Chris. Um, thank you, Tom and Division One, everyone at the ABA. Um, we're at the half hour mark now, so we're going to have to conclude. Um, but we do have uh, Registration uh, links um, in the chat, as well as um, on the forum website uh, for the three remaining uh, toolbox talks in September, October, and December. And uh, look forward to seeing you at those and uh, other Division One and forum events. Thank you.